Good morning. It's great to be here. It's great to see everybody. And oh, I met Paul the first time right after I came off tour with the Mattis Hell Doctors in their 2009 tour. He met me in D.C. And we went to the White House and broke the law. Did You didn't tell him about that. We put white ribbons on the White House fence. You're not supposed to do that. <laughs> we wanted to do something. So um, I've been tasked with um, teaching you everything you need to know about single payer, the new reform, and what's happening in D.C. in the next 30 minutes. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, so there's a lot of stuff I'm going to leave out. And, um, and you know that if you um, want to learn more, you can um, go to our websites, go to pnhp.org, go to healthcare-now.org, and, um, and learn more about what's going on. But I'm going to try to give you a general idea. Um, all right. So I'd like to start out with a little bit of history, and sometimes this slide jumps. We'll hope that it doesn't. But um, it's good to put things in a little bit of a historical context. Um, I picked out some, you know, this could be a whole talk, the history of healthcare reform, but some kind of salient um, points. In the 1940s, um, World War II, the United States had a freeze, freeze on uh, wages, and so we started tying health insurance benefits to employment as a way to attract employees. We're the only nation that does that. In Europe, as a result of World War II, they went in a very different direction and because of the huge de devastation and poverty there, created an anti-poverty package that included national health insurance. But this is kind of a jumping off point of departure between the other Western industrial nations and our nation. In the 1960s, there was a huge belief in the market that the United States was unique. We didn't need a national health system because we had this very unique insurance, private insurance market that if we just let it go, it would cover everybody. Obviously, that didn't happen. But I think the 1980s is really a, a fundamental time of change in this country because that's when our tax dollars were actually used to bring investment groups into the Department of Health and Human Services in Washington, D.C. and train them how to take on health care as a profit-making venture. And so this is when we saw this shift in our language. We started talking about patients are consumers. Like, they're not patients anymore. I remember when they were still patients, but now they're consumers of health care, and health care was starting to be treated as a commodity. And, um, and we started trying to fit medicine into this business model with these for-profit corporations and hospitals, you know, in charge of our health care. Um, so I think it's important to be aware of that. I try to use language that does not feed into that mindset, because that health care is not a business. Health is not a commodity. Patients are people, not consumers. <laughs> All right, I guess I have to point it. Whoops, that way. Okay, so just a few quick things that you need to know. The United States excels in one area, how much we spend on health care. If you look at this chart, it shows you at the top the United States compared to some of the other industrialized nations. You can notice that in the dark red bar part of the United States, that's what we spend in public dollars on health care per person per year. This is actually 2008 data. 2000, you know, currently it's about over $8,000 per person, but the proportions are the same. So we're already spending more in public dollars per person in the United States than these other nations are. They cover almost everybody. They have better health outcomes. They have higher patient and physician satisfaction in those countries. If you add in our private spending, in many cases we're spending twice as much per person. So it's not a matter of money. We're already paying for universal health care. We're just not getting it. And this um, slide, I apologize that the graph is not the same as the top because um, I don't have an updated slide, but it does show you kind of the upward trend in, in the under, uninsured. And you can see how it starts jumping off in the 1980s. And, and it's just continued to go up. The 2009 census data shows us that almost 51 million people in the United States now have no health insurance. And a big part of that jump was people with jobs, or no, I'm sorry, people who lost their jobs and then lost their employer-sponsored health insurance as a result of that. Um, we actually had a bump of 10 million people in 2009, newly uninsured. That's the highest jump that we've seen ever since we started keeping this data. But fortunately, almost 6 million of them were able to get onto public programs. So the overall change was just a little over 4 million. But still, that, that 4 million alone is the biggest jump we've seen. So, um, oh, I've got to remember how to do this. Okay. We're spending a lot of money. We're not covering everybody. We're also not getting a lot for our health care dollars compared to other countries. And this shows um, 
the UK, Canada, Australia, France, Denmark, and Japan, the number of physician visits per person per year, we're at the low end there. We're also at the, at the low end in terms of our usage of healthcare services in general. So we're paying the highest prices, we're spending the most money, we're leaving people out, we're not getting a lot of healthcare services for our dollars. Um, and we're not doing so well. Our health outcomes rank us 37th in the world in areas like infant mortality, maternal mortality, we're ranked very high, two to three times more what we see in other industrialized nations. Life expectancy is not doing well. And this is a study I think is important to look at. This looked at 19 industrialized nations that could be compared and said if each of these nations operated as well as the top three, how many deaths would be prevented? And the United States was the worst. If we operated in one of the top three, we would save over 100,000 lives a year in this country. So, you know, in the United States, we always like to be proud of being the best. Why aren't we trying to be the best in healthcare? Why are we settling for less than that? And, <laughs> thank you. This is a, an important concept that I think everyone, I like people to understand. This is a little bit of health policy stuff, but there's something called the 80-20 rule. If you look at a population of people, 80% of that population is relatively healthy, and 20% of that population uses the majority of the healthcare dollars. But that 20% is fluid. Any one of us can fall into that 20% at any time. So what single payer is all about, what, what, what our current situation is all about with the private insurance is who are they competing to cover? The bottom 80%, right? They, they have a lot of administrators working to, to ensure that bottom 80 80%. In single payer, if 100% is in the system, if 100% is paying in and we're sharing the cost of health care, there's a system there with enough money to cover each of us in our time of need. And that's what single payer is about. So this um, is important to understand why we spend so much. This graph shows the rise in physicians over time. And I want to compare this to the rise in administrators over time. So if you look, that's 3,000%. What are all those people doing? This is the problem with our health care in this country. We're, these people are developing health insurance products. It's a product. They're marketing those products. Then we have to have all the people that decide who, what are the different products, which one do you want to buy. Then you buy it. Then you need care. You've got to figure out where can you get your care. Then you get your care. Who pays what proportion? This is an incredibly wasteful way to finance or, or administer health care. No other nation does it this way. So we waste a third of our health care dollars on this stuff. That's about $400 billion a year that could be used to pay for actual health care under a single-payer system. All right, this is an important concept for you guys to know. Have you heard of consumer-directed health plans? They're all the rage right now. About half of our plans that are bought on the individual market are these consumer-directed plans. There's this whole concept of skin in the game. You have to have skin in the game. If you're not paying for your health care up front, you're not going to make good decisions. Like, like when you get hit by a car, you're laying there and you're thinking, I need to get on the Internet and look up which hospital does best for my broken leg. Right? So um, high deductibles, high premiums. Coinsurance, these, these health savings accounts, which are financial products, they're not really meant, you know, it's another financial thing. Um, these are under insurance products. These products put each of us at risk for bankruptcy, personal bankruptcy, if we have a serious accident or illness. And if you look at, um, oh, well, this is a cycle I love to go through. This is where we are right now as a country. So look at the top. Every year, insurance premiums go up, right? So then you are pushed into purchasing a premium with lower benefits. So then you have more out-of-pocket spending. We know that in, uh, co-pays and deductibles keep people from getting necessary care. So you decrease your use of health services, which means, oops, I didn't control my high blood pressure and I had a stroke. So now you have a more serious problem, which means your premiums go up even more. And this is what people are doing right now. They're riding the cycle till they fall off. Um, but in terms of the, the bankruptcy, this is a study from 2009. It showed that 62% of the personal bankruptcies in this country are due to medical illness, medical cost. And almost 80% of those people that went bankrupt from medical illness had some sort of health insurance. So Katie Robbins has a great phrase that I like to steal from her. She says, health insurance in this country is like an umbrella that melts in the rain. When you need it, it's not there. 
All right, so what did we get for the $938 billion that we're going to spend over the next 10 years for health care? The, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act was based on what's called the mandate model of health care reform. It's been tried before. Massachusetts is the most recent experiment. It's based on an expansion of Medicaid and then mandating that people purchase private insurance if they don't qualify for public programs, and then using tax dollars to subsidize the purchase of that private insurance. So that's tax dollars going to the insurance companies. And then in exchange for that, the private insurers said that they would accept regulation, right? Because they've done so well when we've tried to regulate them in the past. Um, it's more of the same. And actually, I was in California a couple weeks ago, and this Dr. Jim Kahn down there, who's a researcher, said that, you know, when you do a research experiment, you know, in a hospital or in a medical institution, you have to put it to the ethical review board first to get approval. And one of the criteria is that you have to be asking a question that nobody knows the answer to. He said if we put PPACA before an ethical review board, it would fail because we already know the answer. This reform has already failed at the state level, and it's going to fail at the national level. What is the impact of the legislation on the uninsured in this country? Well, the initial estimates in 2009 by the Congressional Budget Office were that it would leave 23 million people still uninsured when it's fully implemented in 2019. Since that data information came out, there have been higher estimates. Um, and, and if we look at state data in states that passed reform, and they always would say, well, we're going to cover this many of the population, none of them ever achieve that goal. So we, don't, we expect it's going to be more than 23 million. Um, new report is saying that even in 2014, when the exchanges kick in, they may, there will probably be 30 to 40 million people with no insurance. So we're still leaving tens of millions of people out. Um, they're also cutting the funding our, our, to our safety net hospitals. This is very concerning. This was tried in Massachusetts. The rationale was that when everybody's covered, you won't need all these safety net hospitals. And uh, they found the opposite in Massachusetts, and now some of those hospitals are suing the state. Um, the one bright shining star in this legislation, from my viewpoint, is the, is the increased funding for community health centers. Because in this time, of our, our community health centers are really needed. They're, they're overflowing with patients. They're having to turn people away. Um, what about the underinsured? Well, the president during the reform process kept saying, if you like your insurance, you can keep it. And that was supposed to make us feel really great. But what he didn't tell you was that if you don't like your insurance, you have to keep it. And so if you have an employer-sponsored plan, you have to keep that plan. And um, the tiers, you know, the, there's going to be different tiers of insurance that you can buy based on how much of your health care costs it's going to cover. And because there's no real control of health premiums, it's going to drive more people into those lower tier plans that cover maybe 60 or 70 percent of your cost. So if we look at, you know, what's considered affordable, a $7,000 premium with a $2,000 copay, I mean a deductible, and then coinsurance, this is $10,000 out of pocket that you're paying just right off the bat. And, and most people just don't have that when they need it. Um, all right, so health reform. We're still, we're still for it. We haven't gotten health care reform. We got some health insurance reform, but we didn't get health care reform. So this is going to continue to leave people out, and it's going to increase our total spending. Actually, surprisingly, there was so much talk about deficit neutrality, but after the reform was passed, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services said that as a result of the reform, our health care costs were going to rise faster than if we had done nothing at all. So that's concerning. Um, it's, you know, it's due to, in part, because of the increased administrative burden of this, of this reform. Um, we're likely to continue our, our trend of underinsured. We know that employers are also looking at, uh, at the opportunity to dump their employer plans. There was an article in the Wall Street Journal where businesses were saying, well, nobody wants to be the first one to dump employer-sponsored insurance, but we're all going to be you know, rushing to be second. Um, so that's concerning. Um, the mandating is that we purchase private insurance, but there's no guarantee that that insurance is going to take care of us when we're sick, um, which is very concerning. And it restricts our choice. You know, you, you still have, you know, you have to choose private insurance, which restricts where you can go to get your care, what physicians you can see, and what care you can get. All right, so um, after decades in this country of trying this model of reform, we know what the outcomes are. It's expensive. It leaves people out. We're going to probably hear more about the health disparities. We have growing health disparities in this country. It's, it's causing our primary care doctors especially to leave practice. This is very serious. And it's growing the number of uninsured and underinsured. Uh, oops. 
uh, just to mention about what, what did we see from the reform process. Well, I think it, it couldn't be any clearer after this reform process that this was, um, this was heavily influenced by the corporations that are profiting off the status quo. And, and it was just so blatant that, you know, looking at the ads that they, that they um, aired, you know, if pharmaceutical companies are in support of the reform, it's probably not good for us. Um, the actual white paper um, that was the original paper for this reform, reform was written by Liz Fowler, who was the senior vice president of uh, public policy at WellPoint, one of the largest insurers in the nation. She then, um, in the Senate Finance Committee, was responsible for overseeing the health reform process in that committee. And then as soon as it passed, surprise, she got appointed to the Department of Health and Human Services to oversee the regulation of this. So this is direct industry involvement, as well as we know the lobbying that was done um, by the industry around this legislation. So we got it. You know, I was worried before the reform passed that after it passed, everybody would say, oh, look, they did it. Yay. They achieved health reform. Let's all go home. No. We saw what happened. We saw that this was an industry-written reform and that if we want real reform, where is it going to come from? It's going to come from us. We have to make it happen. And that's why we're all here. I'm glad to see you guys here. So, um, one of my favorite comics, this is the airplane that represents the U.S. health insurance system. Gosh, we tried every, every reform they'd let us try. It's just not getting off the ground. Um, all right. So what did I learn from the national process? Three things. And, and, and fortunately, um, it falls into the initials ICU, which in the medical world stands for intensive care unit. So we're in a crisis. We need ICU. We, as a movement, must be independent of political parties. We cannot be allied to a political party because when you do that, you, are, you subordinate their agenda to your agenda. So as a movement, we've got to be independent. We have to be clear about what we want. And this is where education comes in. Education is so important because words get used in different ways. This reform was PPAC, it was called universal. But it's not universal. It was called guaranteed and affordable, but it's none of those things. So we have to be clear on what those things mean and uncompromising. We can no longer settle for reforms that we know don't work. We've got to push hard for, for what the real reform is. Um, all right. So what is single payer? You guys probably know this, and, and we'll do single payer 101. But the basics are it's a single risk pool. Everybody in, nobody out. It means that that people contribute to health care based on their ability to pay. We're the most regressive of the nations in the way that we finance health care so that people with lower incomes are paying a higher percentage of their income for health care. We need to reverse that and get rid of co-pays and deductibles because all they do is co cause more administrative burden and they cause people to delay or avoid necessary care. Um, we need to um, cover all medically necessary care. There's no reason why an entity should profit off of necessary care. If you want to profit off of other elective things, I don't have a problem with that. But if, if someone needs their care, they need to get their care. Um, simplified administration. We know that single payer, we can, we can streamline it. One set of rules for patients, for healthcare professionals, it costs much less. Um, choice of physician and treatment in the system everybody's in. You choose where you get to go. You and your doctor or other health professional decide what treatment you get, not an insurance administrator. Um, focus on preventive and timely care. Timely as we, as we remove financial barriers, people can actually go get the care they need when they need it and have better outcomes and hopefully cost less. And then finally, we demand accountability and transparency in our healthcare system so that we know where our healthcare dollars are going. So this is the pool, that NHP fund, that's the pool. And what we do is we take our health care dollars, our federal, state, local, some employer contributions, some other taxes, all that goes into the pool. And then out of the pool, that goes to pay for the health care. For the infrastructure, 80% of our health care costs are, are staffing, equipment, buildings, goes to pay for that, goes to pay for the individual care, including long-term care. Um, how, do, how can we afford this? We know that single payer has proven cost controls and we have numerous studies and this is based on a study that was done in California for the state just showing that 
the increased cost of covering people who aren't getting care and of removing the, the copays and deductibles is more than offset by the inherent cost controls in single payer of global budgeting for hospitals so they get, a, they get the money they need to care for their population. So no, more, no longer are small community hospitals going to go out of business. They have the money that they need to take care of their population. Of creating um, in this country the ability to actually negotiate for fair prices for services, pharmaceuticals, and devices. Um, there's a great article by Uva Reinhardt called It's the Price is Stupid because in the United States we have no negotiating ability to negotiate for these prices and that's why we pay the most. Um, so we can actually create savings through a, a national health program. All right, we have what it takes. We've got great hospitals, well-trained professionals. We've got um, great research. We are spending enough money. So um, I'm going to go a little bit into what's going on now with the movement. Uh, let's see. There we go. So Paul said 17 states. I have 20 states that are in some phase of single-payer legislation, and I know that um, North Carolina, I'm heading down there in a couple weeks, they're going to introduce legislation, and do I have New Jersey? New Jersey also, I was out there not too long ago, they're looking at it. So more than 20 states that are looking at state single-payer bills. Um, one state that we're very excited about right now is Vermont. Have you guys been hearing about Vermont? Yeah. Up with that? yeah. So um, we haven't seen the legislation yet. We have seen the proposal that they, that they put together. Um, the proposal needs some improvement to, to give it some of the cross controls that we want to see from a single payer bill, but they're continuing to push in Vermont and we need to continue to let them know it, that, that we're hoping that they can lead the way and pass single payer for our nation. Uh, there we go. Um, what do we need to do? Education, education, education. <laughs> As Paul said, it's not enough for us to know about this. We've got to take it out of here. So here's a very simple rule. If every single one of you can talk to one person a day, one new person a day about single-payer health care, we can really spread this. If you have a group that you belong to, bring single-payer to your group. Bring it to your family, your workplace. Everybody needs to know about this. Don't be afraid to talk about it. Um, Building coalitions, that's why it's so great to see that this was a PNHP, Jobs with Justice, and all the other groups that came together, because it's, it's really going to be, a, this has got to be solidarity of the groups. This is about social and economic justice. Any group that's concerned about social and economic justice, we should all be working together to make this happen. Um, and then um, some interesting projects that are going on around the country, putting some pressure on, on health insurance companies. If there's some divestment campaigns, there's a shareholder resolution campaign going on against WellPoint to force them to look at becoming nonprofit. Um, these are some creative ways. I think the divestment campaign could really be an exciting way for college campuses to get involved. I was in college in the 80s with the apartheid, anti-apartheid movement, and I know that really got us involved. Um, so that's kind of a neat idea. And then, you know, it's striking to me how many people don't even understand what health justice is or when they're being, when they're being treated, you know, with health injustice. They don't realize that premiums going up out of control, that being denied care, that um, you know, having being kicked out of the emergency room, you know, without the proper care that you need. These are all health injustices. Doctors being fired because they're spending too much time with their patients. Nurses being forced to take care of too many patients. Um, these are all health injustices that are occurring. Community clinics that are closing down. Community hospitals that are closing down. So. These are opportunities for us to expose what's going on in this country, to show that this is wrong, that this doesn't happen in other places. Other industrialized nations do not have this situation. We're abnormal. And so these are all opportunities to build solidarity in your community to fight for health justice and to make the point that single payer would, would change that situation. So I think I'm almost done. Yep, here we go. So why aren't we trying to be the best? Why don't we try to go for a national improved Medicare for all? It's the patriotic thing to do, right? So thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you throughout the day. You've been listening to Dr. Margaret Flowers of Physicians for a National Health Plan speaking at the Oregon Single Payer Conference on January 29, 2011 in Portland, Oregon. To find out more about the campaign for single payer health care, please visit the Physicians for a National Health Plan website at pnhp.org. You can find out more about the campaign by visiting the Healthcare Now website at healthcare-now.org. 
the Mad as Hell Doctors at their website at madashelldoctors.com and from the Oregon Single Payer Campaign at facebook.com slash singlepayeroregon. This program was produced by PDX Justice Media Productions of Portland, Oregon. To find out more about our work and to access our growing library of free on-demand streaming video and audio programs, please visit our website at pdxjustice.org. You can also watch our programs on YouTube and on the Vimeo Home for Videos at vimeo.com. Vimeo is also available as a channel streaming in high definition direct to your television via the Netflix on-demand video service. Thanks for tuning in, and thanks for supporting listener-sponsored radio, public access cable television, net neutrality, independent bookstores, and all forms of grassroots, democratic, community media.